The power back of the attraction and combination of these forces of the mind can no more be explained than can the power back of the combination of elements out of which an apple tree grows. But the all-important thing is that an apple tree will grow from a seed thus properly planted, and great achievement will follow the systematic blending of two or more minds with a definite object in view. In Lesson 13, you will see this principle of allied effort carried to proportions which almost stagger the imagination of all who have not trained themselves to think in terms of organized thought. This course itself is a very concrete illustration of the principle underlying that which we have termed organized effort, but you will observe that it requires the entire sixteen lessons to complete the description of this principle. Omit a single one of the sixteen lessons, and the omission would affect the whole as the removal of one link would affect the whole of a chain. As I have already stated in many different ways, and for the purpose of emphasis, I now repeat, there is a well-founded hypothesis that when one concentrates one's mind upon a given subject, facts of a nature that is closely related to that subject will pour in from every conceivable source. The theory is that a deeply-seated desire, when once planted in the right sort of mental soil, serves as a center of attraction or magnet that attracts to it everything that harmonizes with the nature of the desire. Dr. Elmer Gates of Washington, D.C. is perhaps one of the most competent psychologists in the world. He is recognized both in the field of psychology and in other directly and indirectly related fields of science throughout the world as being a man of the highest scientific standing. Come with me for a moment and study his methods. After Dr. Gates has followed a line of investigation as far as possible through the usual channels of research, and has availed himself of all the recorded facts at his command on a given subject, he then takes a pencil and a tablet and sits, for further information, by concentrating his mind on that subject until thoughts related to it begin to flow in upon him. He writes down these thoughts as they come, from he knows not where. He told me that many of his most important discoveries came through this method. It was more than twenty years ago that I first talked with Dr. Gates on this subject. Since that time, through the discovery of the radio principle, we have been provided with a reasonable hypothesis through which to explain the results of these sittings, viz. The ether, as we have discovered through the modern radio apparatus, is in a constant state of agitation. Sound waves are floating through the ether at all times. But these waves cannot be detected beyond a short distance from their source except by the aid of properly attuned instruments. Now it seems reasonable to suppose that thought, being the most highly organized form of energy known, is constantly sending waves through the ether. But these waves, like those of sound, can only be detected and correctly interpreted by a properly attuned mind. There is no doubt that when Dr. Gates sat down in a room and placed himself in a quiet passive state of mind, the dominating thoughts in his mind served as a magnetic force that attracted the related or similar thought waves of others as they passed through the ether about him. Taking the hypothesis just a step further, it has occurred to me many times since the discovery of the modern radio principle that every thought that has ever been released in organized form from the mind of any human being is still in existence in the form of a wave in the ether and is constantly passing around and around in a great endless circle, that the act of concentrating one's mind upon a given subject with intensity sends out thought waves which reach and blend with those of a related or similar nature, thereby establishing a direct line of communication between the one doing the concentrating and the thoughts of a similar nature which have been previously set into motion. Going still a step further, May it not be possible for one so to attune his mind and harmonize the rate of vibration of thought with the rate of vibration of the ether, that all knowledge that has been accumulated through the organized thoughts of the past is available? With these hypotheses in mind, go back to Lesson 2 of this course and study Carnegie's description of the mastermind through which he accumulated his great fortune. When Carnegie formed an alliance between more than a score of carefully selected minds, he created, by that means of compounding mind power, one of the strongest industrial forces that the world has ever witnessed. With a few notable and very disastrous exceptions, the men constituting the mastermind which Carnegie created thought and acted as one.
and that mastermind, composed of many individual minds, was concentrated upon a single purpose, the nature of which is familiar to everyone who knew Mr. Carnegie, particularly those who were competing with him in the steel business. If you have followed Henry Ford's record, even slightly, you undoubtedly have observed that concentrated effort has been one of the outstanding features of his career. Nearly thirty years ago, he adopted a policy of standardization as to the general type of automobile that he would build, and he consistently maintained that policy until the change in public demand forced him in 1927 to change it. A few years ago, I met the former chief engineer of the Ford plant, and he told me of an incident that happened during the early stages of Mr. Ford's automobile experience, which very clearly points to concentrated effort as being one of his prominent fundamentals of economic philosophy. On this occasion, the engineers of the Ford plant had gathered in the engineering office for the purpose of discussing a proposed change in the design of the rear axle construction of the Ford automobile. Mr. Ford stood around and listened to the discussion until each man had had his say, then he walked over to the table, tapped the drawing of the proposed axle with his finger, and said, Now listen, the axle we are using does the work for which it was intended, and does it well, and there's going to be no more change in that axle. He turned and walked away, and from that day until this the rear axle construction of the Ford automobile has remained substantially the same. It is not improbable that Mr. Ford's success in building and marketing automobiles has been due very largely to his policy of consistently concentrating his efforts back of one plan, with but one definite purpose in mind at a time. A few years ago I read Edward Bach's book, The Man from Maine, which is the biography of his father-in-law, Mr. Cyrus H. K. Curtis, the owner of the Saturday Evening Post, the Ladies' Home Journal, and several other publications. All through the book I noticed that the outstanding feature of Mr. Curtis's philosophy was that of concentration of effort back of a definite purpose. During the early days of his ownership of the Saturday Evening Post, when he was pouring money into a losing venture by the hundreds of thousands of dollars, it required concentrated effort that was backed by courage such as but few men possess to enable him to carry on. Read The Man from Maine. It is a splendid lesson on the subject of concentration, and supports, to the smallest detail, the fundamentals upon which this lesson is based. The Saturday Evening Post is now one of the most profitable magazines in the world, but its name would have been long since forgotten had not Mr. Curtis concentrated his attention and his fortune on the one definite purpose of making it a great magazine. We have seen what an important part environment and habit play in connection with the subject of concentration. We shall now discuss, briefly, a third subject which is no less related to the subject of concentration than are the other two, namely, memory. The principles through which an accurate, unfaltering memory may be trained are few and comparatively simple, viz. 1. Retention the receiving of a sense impression through one or more of the five senses, and the recording of this impression in orderly fashion in the mind. This process may be likened to the recording of a picture on the sensitized plate of a camera or Kodak. 2. Recall. The reviving or recalling into the conscious mind of those sense impressions which have been recorded in the subconscious mind. This process may be compared to the act of going through a card index and pulling out a card on which information had been previously recorded. 3. Recognition The ability to recognize a sense impression when it is called into the conscious mind, and to identify it as being a duplicate of the original impression, and to associate it with the original source from which it came when it was first recorded. This process enables us to distinguish between memory and imagination. These are the three principles that enter into the act of remembering. Now let us make application of these principles and determine how to use them effectively, which may be done as follows. First, when you wish to be sure of your ability to recall a sense impression, such as a name, date, or place, be sure to make the impression vivid by concentrating your attention upon it to the finest detail. An effective way to do this is to repeat several times that which you wish to remember just as a photographer must give an exposure proper time to record itself on the sensitized plate of the camera, 
so must we give the subconscious mind time to record properly and clearly any sense impression that we wish to be able to recall with readiness. Second, associate that which you wish to remember with some other object, name, place, or date with which you are quite familiar, and which you can easily recall when you wish, as, for example, the name of your hometown, your close friend, the date of your birth, etc., for your mind will then file away the sense impression that you wish to be able to recall with the one that you can easily recall, so that when bringing forth one into the conscious mind it brings also the other one with it. Third, repeat that which you wish to remember a number of times, at the same time concentrating your mind upon it, just as you would fix your mind on a certain hour at which you wished to arise in the morning, which, as you know, ensures your awakening at that precise hour. The common failing of not being able to remember the names of other people, which most of us have, is due entirely to the fact that we do not properly record the name in the first place. When you are introduced to a person whose name you wish to be able to recall at will, repeat that name four or five times, first making sure that you understood the name correctly. If the name is similar to that of some person whom you know well, associate the two names together thinking of both as you repeat the name of the one whose name you wish to be able to recall. If someone gives you a letter to be mailed, look at the letter, then increase its size in your imagination, and see it hanging over a letter box. Fix in your mind a letter approximating the size of a door, and associate it with a letter box, and you will observe that the first letter box you pass on the street will cause you to recall that big, odd-looking letter which you have in your pocket. Suppose that you were introduced to a lady whose name was Elizabeth Shearer, and you wished to be able to recall her name at will. As you repeat her name, associate it with a large pair of scissors, say ten feet in length, and Queen Elizabeth, and you will observe that the recalling of either the large pair of scissors or the name of Queen Elizabeth will help you recall also the name of Elizabeth Shearer. If you wish to be able to remember the name of Lloyd Keith, just repeat the name several times and associate with it the name of Lloyd George and Keith's Theatre, either of which you can easily recall at will. The law of association is the most important feature of a well-trained memory, yet it is a very simple law. All you have to do to make use of it is to record the name of that which you wish to remember with the name of that which you can readily remember, and the recalling of one brings with it the other. Nearly ten years ago, a friend gave me his residence telephone number in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and although I did not write it down, I remember it today as well as I did the day he gave it to me. This is the way that I recorded it. The number and exchange were Lakeview 2651. At the time he gave me the number, we were standing at the railroad station in sight of Lake Michigan. Therefore, I used the lake as an associated object with which to file the name of the telephone exchange. It so happened that the telephone number was made up of the age of my brother, who was twenty-six, and my father, who was fifty-one. Therefore, I associated their names with the number, thus ensuring its recall. To recall the telephone exchange and number, therefore, I had only to think of Lake Michigan, my brother, and my father. An acquaintance of mine found himself to be suffering from what is ordinarily called a wandering mind. He was becoming absent-minded and unable to remember. Let him tell you in his own words which follow how he overcame this handicap. I am fifty years old. For a decade I have been a department manager in a large factory. At first my duties were easy, then the firm had a rapid expansion of business which gave me added responsibilities. Several of the young men in my department developed unusual energy and ability. At least one of them had his eye on my job. I had reached the age in life when a man likes to be comfortable, and having been with the company a long time, I felt that I could safely settle back into an easy berth. The effect of this mental attitude was well-nigh disastrous to my position. About two years ago I noticed that my power of concentration was weakening, and my duties were becoming irksome. I neglected my correspondence until I looked with dread upon the formidable pile of letters. Reports accumulated and subordinates were inconvenienced by the delay. I sat at my desk with my mind wandering elsewhere. Other circumstances showed plainly that my mind was not on my work. I forgot to attend an important meeting of the officers of the company. One of the clerks under me caught a bad mistake made in an estimate on a carload of goods, and of course saw to it that the manager learned of the incident. 
I was thoroughly alarmed at the situation, and asked for a week's vacation to think things over. I was determined to resign, or find the trouble and remedy it. A few days of earnest introspection at an out-of-the-way mountain resort convinced me that I was suffering from a plain case of mind-wandering. I was lacking in concentration. My physical and mental activities at the desk had become desultory. I was careless and shiftless and neglectful, all because my mind was not alertly on the job. When I had diagnosed my case with satisfaction to myself, I next sought the remedy. I needed a complete new set of working habits, and I made a resolve to acquire them. With paper and pencil, I outlined a schedule to cover the working day. First the morning mail, then the orders to be filled, dictation, conference with subordinates and miscellaneous duties, ending with a clean desk before I left. How is habit formed? I asked myself mentally. By repetition, came back the answer. But I have been doing these things over and over thousands of times, the other fellow in me protested. True, but not in orderly, concentrated fashion, replied the echo. I returned to the office with mind in leash, but restless, and placed my new working schedule in force at once. I performed the same duties with the same zest and as nearly as possible at the same time every day. When my mind started to slip away, I quickly brought it back. From a mental stimulus created by willpower, I progressed in habit-building. Day after day, I practiced concentration of thought. When I found repetition becoming comfortable, then I knew that I had won. Your ability to train your memory, or to develop any desired habit, is a matter solely of being able to fix your attention on a given subject until the outline of that subject has been thoroughly impressed upon the sensitized plate of your mind. Concentration itself is nothing but a matter of control of the attention. 